Charlotte, thank you very much for letting us into your student home to talk about OMI and musical instruments and music. Oh, it's lovely to meet you. Thank you. Starting at the beginning, yeah. um, you have uh, a musical background, um, th which is not all that common. We have quite a few people that have come to us through OMI, particularly amputees um, and injuries, um, most usually. But a lot of people who have no experience in music at all. But you do have that experience in your background, don't you? When I was a child, I did piano lessons prior to becoming disabled. Um, it was just a thing that everyone did, and I did it along with all my friends. It sounds like it wasn't um, very motivating at the time. Um, no, I just, it didn't particularly infuse me. But I, I enjoyed it, but nothing more, nothing less, really. So between there and after the injury, there's, there's a, obviously a huge hiatus um, and, and your increasing disability. Um, what, what went on that reintroduced you to music through that process? Um, I had about a seven year break from music and then one day I was um, in school and was given a choice of cooking lesson or doing music. The cooking lessons were so dire and patronising. It was teaching me how to like put butter on bread and how you put toast in a toaster and stuff. So I jumped at a chance for music. A few weeks later, I was hooked completely and utterly in deep and in love with music. It became my life. It was, it was something I lived for, I worked for. And how were you relating to music then? Was, it, was there an instrument involved? Was it just listening or study? And to begin with, I got to know my teacher, Doug Bott, through listening to music and talking about which instruments were involved and sort of, I guess, more of a technical side. I think it was more of a chance for us to get to know each other and um, for him to see what I possibly could or couldn't do and stuff. And then I went on to using many sensors, switches and Ableton. Um, Doug pre-programmed notes into Ableton and I was able to control them through my head movement. So I may have anything between one and 12, 15 notes above my head which I can control through different mov movements. I often say to people who um, play conventional instruments my head was like 10 fingers, so um, it was just a different way of connecting with an instrument even though it wasn't the traditional type. This is when you made the video of the Bach cello suite? Yes. This is a very beautiful thing, it's, it's really beautifully played. And uh, the, the instrument too is, has got a, a genuine cello sound, it, it shows that that sort of emulation, although it's very early days and, and rather cumbersome in that setting, it's still, it is possible to, to, to do that. It definitely is possible and I, I absolutely loved it, but you, I guess what it lacks is being able to have an expression, an emotion, yes. whereas, which you can do with a traditional instrument. Mm. Even though I was able to play the notes, I was able to control the speed, the length I held a note for, there was no physical, um, physical, I don't know, drive towards a particular note in question. And that relationship with tonality and timbre and pitch and all yes. the subtle is the thing that makes the note, things that makes the music. Yeah. Just take it back for uh, just half a step back at this, that your relationship with music then is via these electronic devices. Yes. Via the world of MIDI. Um, uh, did that frustrate you? Was there another world of music that, was, that you felt was close to you? Um, it did frustrate me an awful lot, especially when I started to get to grips with it and I started to enjoy it and I started being able to play. I played um, Greek to begin with, then went on to play Bach. I wanted to see if I could get um, well recognised for the work I was doing so like I could progress and be able to demonstrate that I was able to play and perform at a certain level. No um, music school or examinings board would acknowledge the way I played in any format, I couldn't take any conventional exams. And that really annoyed me because I loved learning the traditional way, even though I wasn't playing a traditional instrument. I wanted to know everything else traditionally as much as I could and go through like the classical notation route and stuff. Whereas playing with MIDI and stuff, that's not very normal. You generally go down more of, I guess, the R&B, pop, hip hop route, that kind of thing. What were you listening to at this time? What sort of music were you listening to? Um, I was listening to all sorts, I guess a lot of chart music, um, but for, throughout my life I've always listened to specific music depending on my mood. 
So that can be anything from classical to opera to like true pop to indie. But my big love at that time was Robbie Williams. <laughs> okay, that's not so much a love of music though, I suspect. But uh, um, the, did you did the, the did you feel an, an, an the need to play the music you were listening to? Was the, was that connection there, or was what you were doing in music and what you were listening to are they two separate worlds? Um, they're two separate things completely, really. Um, I was more interested in producing classical music. Um, which again was quite unusual, I keep being told this, um, but that was what I was interested in doing, so Doug found a way for me to, to enable me to do that. And then let's talk about why that's difficult. The instruments that are available to you in the classical orchestra, actually the same problem applies whether you're in a rock band or wherever you're playing a guitar, for example. Um, uh, is exactly the same problem with a classical guitar or or an or or electronic guitar. The, the instruments are obviously different or used in different ways, but they all have the same problem and this difficulty about needing two highly dexterous hands and arms. Yes, I actually brought a guitar um, a couple of years ago and tried to learn to play it because I kind of naively thought I only really needed my fingers, but it was impossible. So now my sister has it. I couldn't hold it, it was far too big and bulky. I didn't have the strength in my hands. Even though I now have finger movement, I didn't have the strength in them either. Didn't have the strength to press and move the keys, yeah. the, the strings? or and to move my frets. arms up and down. Right, and what about actually the, the using the, the strings, strumming on the strings themselves, was that possible? Um, to a vague degree, I mean, not properly, no. So that, that instrument is parked, okay, that one doesn't yeah. work. And have you tried others? Again, a while ago, I went to a music shop and I sat outside because it was inaccessible. Like, the whole of the music world is inaccessible. Um, <laughs> and the lady in the shop was so lovely, though. She brought out every single instrument one by one <laughs> and allowed me to try it on the street. <laughs> okay. And the only instrument I could vaguely hold and make a sound out of was a clarinet. Okay, let's get, go through them. What, what did she bring out to you? Um, the trumpet. Okay, what was the problem with the trumpet? You can, you can hold the trumpet with one hand, can't you? Um, I don't have the strength to hold it with one hand, no. Okay. It's too heavy for me. Right. If it was a lot lighter mm -hmm. um, and there was some way of kind of fixing it up there, I would be fine. Except you then can't use the tuning slides, which you need for three valves. Y yeah. So you'd still be, it would still be limited, even if you could do, even if you could hold the weight. Yeah. And you also have to have pressure onto the mouth, through the mouthpiece, which is quite a problem. I could do the mouthpiece. You could. And I could, okay. if the, I guess if the valves were lightened, I could do yeah. them. Do you have the, the, the lung capacity and the strength to, to...? Yeah, I've got a lot of hot air. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of hot air. <laughs> yeah. So what else, what else did they bring you? Um, saxophone. Oh, really? Okay. Now, the saxophone is, is an instrument that there are quite a few adaptions for one hand. Um, but you're, it's not so much a one-handed issue for you, is it? It's a, no, it's more of a strength and movement strength issue. Strength and movement, okay. Yeah. So the same problem applied yeah. in not being able to hold the instrument, even though it's strapped around your neck? Yes, because that may take the weight, but it doesn't keep it under control from yes. moving and stuff. Quite. And what about fingers on the keys? The saxophone had too many keys, and it was just that too much of movement, whereas yeah. the clarinet turned out to have... It still had a lot of keys, but your hands stay in the same place. Okay. Um, other instruments she brought out for yes. me to try included the recorder, okay. which we've kind of seen the obvious choice because it's quite light. Um, I guess reasonably easy to hold for most people, but I actually found it really hard to hold. There was no grip place. There was nowhere to like hook on to my hands and things. Mm -hmm. And she also brought out the oboe. Yes. Um, she literally brought out every instrument in the shop okay. and it just, the clarinet was the only one. Really? The oboe has a, has a, a similar uh, weight and holding problem as the clarinet though, doesn't it? Did you find that more difficult? To, yes. Really? Yeah. For, again, for weight and stretch? And the, okay. Perhaps you could show me on the clarinet. Let me of course. Get it for you. Here's the thing. I'll take this clip off for you. Yes, please. Right. Thank you. I'm very ungentle with my clarinet. <laughs> but 
I sit in a very weird position when I play. It just helps me. I take this off one. Yeah. Obviously, I'm bent forward, which a lot of music teachers do not like. Yes. But it suits me. I can balance it on my leg as well as taking a weight with my neck. Right. So all I've got to think about is my fingers. You can hold the pressure in your mouth, okay? Yeah. Like that. And can you reach all the keys that you need to reach and with reasonable well, speed? I can do the, these main ones fine. Mm -hmm. I am struggling with these ones because of my strength, which at the moment is currently holding me back. Right. Because I've got to grips with these, all these keys um, perfectly. And does it vary with your fingers, the strength with, individually with your fingers, or is it a general weakness that's similar across the whole hand? Well, my hands are generally weak, but I guess my little fingers are the weaker ones. And also, when I start going down here, I find it really hard to keep my fingers covering these. If the keys were closer together, so that you didn't have to stretch your hand... I'd be so much better, even if like all these six were to get closer and it was all a lot... Yes. If it could be shrunk a couple of inches, yes, it'd be a lot better. Okay, that does seem though to be possible, and the, the the problem of holding it is surely can be overcome with a clamp of some sort. Well, um, one of my old music teachers is looking into a clamp for me. The thing is, I'm trying to find something which allows me to play it, pick it up, and play it when I want to, rather than relying on someone else to clamp it into place. Yes, because if I end up relying on someone, there's no. I will lose interest. I, w I just won't do it as much. Yes, of course. Whereas now I can just pick it up, play for 30 seconds, put it down, and then an hour later I can pay for half an hour, do what I want. Yes. And you say you have more than enough hot air for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the pressure's not a problem. No. I say. So it's that, that is a feasible instrument for you. Yeah. So music clearly is very important uh, to you and a very important part of your life. Yeah, it's hugely important, and I would have pursued it at university if I had had the choice. What about as a performer? Do you think that could have been a possible career for you? Would you be th that much interested in...? Definitely. Um, if I had had more options earlier on, um, I would have definitely taken it to uni and be doing it um, within bands and orchestras. Even my university's orchestra wouldn't accept me because they didn't recognise music technology as an instrument. Yes. Um, yeah. So that it's the, the, the point we've may be making in OMI is that this isn't, shouldn't be a question about ability, disability. It's actually a question about the instruments, that the instruments are all made Definitely. in one particular physical circumstance. If there was an instrument you could buy off the shelf, which was more adaptable, and it could fit into the classical setting, because even with any time, type of band or group, they all have classical music, music classical instruments to a certain degree yes. and um, music tech is still very new and very limited with a lot of people's mindsets and if there was a traditional instrument available to buy I know I would have got it. Which means that the, the what is opening up to is not just the experience of playing music which is clearly very important to you and clearly important to a lot of people and when you listen to the world of music that's yeah. playing <laughs> all around the globe, all the time, um, that all that music is played by people who don't have physical disabilities. It is. It's an extraordinary thing. Which is really sad. It, it, is, it is tragic and it's something we are trying to do something yeah. about. Uh, and it ought to be very straightforward, actually, just to, to alter instruments. It turns out to be very, very difficult. One of the reasons it turns out to be difficult, I know you know this, but let me say it again, um, one of the reasons it turns out to be so hard is this problem of the relationship between creating the note and the body. That if you put a collection of electronic devices in, so you don't have problems of holding, you don't have problems of dexterity, you don't have problems of reach, and all these other things go away. So you have an electronic box. You've still got you producing something. An electronic box is actually producing the end result you don't have is that same control of the note, at least as the technology currently exists. But this, to me, is a very important factor. Do, do, do you find yourself thinking along those lines? Um, I think technology can get you incredibly far, but 
um, the musical world is very closed and it's very shut down to anything except the norms. And music technology will never be able to break down those norms, I don't think. And, it's ve and you have to be very computer-minded to be able to produce... Um, good quality music on a computer, which isn't what you're really there for. You're there to produce music and play. Do you think the same would be true? Sorry to interrupt you, but do you think the same would be true if you had an instrument which was producing a sound with your eyes closed? Nobody would be able to tell that it wasn't, say, a clarinet or a trumpet or a violin. Um, no, well, I think it depends on the sound. Like, if you're just producing one sound, I don't think you'd be able to tell, but if you're producing a whole piece, you'd definitely be able to tell. You can tell at the moment. Oh yeah, of course, because, um, well, a traditional instrument has slow motion and feeling yeah. and yes. you can tell where well, you can get an incredibly talented, classically trained pianist, for example, but then their music they play is dead. They're just playing the notes. Or you can get someone with pure emotion and feeling and it's just a completely different way of listening and hearing. Yes, it comes back to this interface problem yes. again. But we all have limitations that, that, uh, that, that everyone will get to a standard of performance and probably for most people they're going to say it's not good enough. There is a limitation physically or in some way their talent is missing. Is that the same thing? Um, well I don't know because obviously everyone's got limitations but if you don't have the access you're completely limited. Yes. Um, if you don't have, well, if you don't for example, if you don't have a French teacher or no way of learning French, how are you going to learn it? You don't know if you're going to be fluent in it or if you're going to be rubbish at it. Hmm. So access is the fundamental issue, and it's access to an instrument which can perform with the same potential for virtuosity as Absolutely. all those Absolutely. It has to be equal, yeah. and it has to be... It can't be simplified. It has to be able to have some sort of talent, I guess, behind it, so it's acknowledged to the same level. Yes. Well, that is... The only challenge which we've neatly summed up here. That process of making um, progress through, requires tuition. It uh, tends to be formed around examinations, but the, the top teachers, of course, are also in that system of teaching. Yes. Is that closed to you? Um, at the moment, it's completely closed. If they don't accept new instruments or new ways of playing, no one will ever be able to progress, no matter what's produced in the market. It's up to the top musical scholars to accept it and embrace it and say this can be graded, this can be examined, we can teach you this and it, in a similar way to the way we teach you this. Once that happens, I think a lot more will be it's more acceptable. Why do you think they don't at the moment? Um, because I know I've had problems with being graded um, or examined in any form and I was only looking at the basics of basics um, and I know I'm not the only one. There's been many people who have tried to get um, marked or awarded who are not unable because they're not playing a traditional instrument and that, is, that then goes on to prevent them from um, attending university depending on the course. Some you need grade 8 to get into and things like that. And you would say then there are not just a few people like you but a lot of people like you yes, in this situation? Yes, I would, definitely. And, and that have expressed to you or that you uh, have direct experience of them wanting to play music. Well, but where do you think that urge comes from when they haven't had that experience in the first place? Um, I think once you're introduced to music and you've got that freedom to be able to express yourself, you've got to remember a lot of disabled people can't express themselves. When I was first introduced to music, I couldn't um, verbalise. Um, I had very little movement. And that was literally my way of telling people I was angry, I was upset, I was happy. Literally, uh, my music teacher got to the stage where he could understand my emotions by what I composed. And because I had no other way of saying it. And at my school, I saw other people who could not talk at all, hardly had any movement, but being able to show they had abilities. Whereas prior to them being introduced to music, people didn't think they did. Music's a whole world which is which should be, everyone should be able to access, not just people who are completely able-bodied. Do you think there are many, going to be many disabled people who have had no contact with music because it's just closed off to them, it's not something they could ever gain any experience of, they think, and therefore 
may have this desire and may get these rewards if it was introduced to them. Definitely, a large portion of my friends have never touched an instrument. One or two have gone down a music technology route, um, but the ones who've done that are interested in house, heavy metal, rock, that kind of thing. So the stereotypical type of music that you'd relate to music technology in the traditional sense, whereas now it's reasonably well known that you can use it for any type of music. Do you think the public has any view on this, generally? Do you think it's this, this institutional restriction that you've talked about? Um, is that separate from the general public view? Or do you think that, there are these, that the institutions are merely reflecting a general public view? I don't know, because um, a lot of special schools may have music lessons. But that will consist of, from my knowledge and my friends, I don't know about everyone, obviously, a group of disabled people sitting in a circle and either one person playing a guitar, the music teacher, and singing at them and then just sitting there staring at them, or them being passed a drum or a shaker or a rattle. Half of them can't hold them, use them. And once you get over the age of eight, they're still doing it in these special schools and they're expecting you to interact, which the students don't want. They're treating it as therapy, not as actually the musical experience. Yeah. My first form of, um, my first sort of introduction to music when I became disabled was music therapy. I sat in a room with this guy and he played a frigging guitar at me and other times he brought out the fucking wind chimes and he'd bang them in my face. I hated the bloody sound and I just had to sit there and he's like, how are you feeling today? Like, I was fine before I saw you. <laughs> and I just, and I just, it was so patronising. And it was just, then other people went and they were allowed to hold a guitar or pluck a string. That was a music lesson. That's not a music lesson. It's something quite different, yeah. isn't it? Uh, but this... They mean well, is I think the best no, one can say. No, they do. They're ignorant. <laughs> okay. They have not been taught about disabilities. So okay. many people in the world look at disability and think, oh, you're thick. Go and sit in the cupboard or something and don't come out. We don't really want to see you because it makes us feel bad. That's true. And you're professionals too. You'll or... definitely never be able to interact within society or get a job or anything. So why are we even pumping money into you? Is that right? That's my opinion. No, no, clearly. Uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> and it's well expressed, I <laughs> Sorry. No, not at all. I Don't apologise for it. goodness sake. But the, I, what I'm interested in, though, is... is uh, well, I'm interested in that, but I'm particularly interested in this, uh, this, this. The institutional problem doesn't come from nowhere. It's, it's not self-invented. It, it, there are some exceptions, I think, to that. Of course. But there are more that aren't, yes. <laughs> of the, that are like that. It must be a something in, in within society and yet it's this contradiction that at the same time music is supremely important to most of the world yes. and it has been through time and yet it's at the same time one of those things that is not open to you I, it, it's an extraordinary block that simply shouldn't exist but as a country, do we um, embrace music to the same level as many other countries? We play a lot of it, and we spend a lot of money buying it, making it, subsidising it yeah. in, the, in the classical field. You think how many radio stations, every TV programme, you know, it's going across the air all the time. Yeah, um, I think with regards to special needs schools, perhaps um, society doesn't see it as a need. Um, if you, I don't know if you can play a song that's lovely, but is that going to get you more independent? Whereas if people, perhaps the um, musical organisations went down a more academic route and said, if this person learns to play music, they become more focused and they have the ability to, um, it helps them remember things or it helps them relax for the rest of the day so they're able to intake information from work. I think that may go down better. But they're still looking for a functional argument, aren't they? They're still saying, say, play music because it may have this beneficial effect. Whereas yes. what they should be saying is that music is a richness in life that everybody should enjoy. But I think society would accept it more if it has an effect. If it has that functional element. Yeah. Do you think so? That's because, um, well, I don't know, but if you talk to someone who's perhaps slightly ignorant on disability matters, they... And they may not be, they may like and enjoy music, but they may not have ever played it. They may not see the need for someone who's disabled to play it. In a sense, it's not their business, is it? But no, but they make decisions. <laughs> they make decisions for you. 
I think society as a whole do. They yes. influence um, yes. what happens in special needs schools. Yes. In a sense, the absence of a decision, coming back to the OMI Trust and what we're doing, yeah. the absence of a decision of people to say, this is not good enough, we will do something about this, is like a decision of that same kind. It's, it's taking decisions for you. That's not good for you. It won't get you anywhere. We've yeah. decided you won't bother. Yeah. That's what they're saying, isn't it? Yeah, whereas everyone should have the option to have music lessons, whether at school or college, just like, well, everyone who's disabled should, just like anyone else. Yes. I know when I wanted to have um, singing lessons when I was learning to talk again because my speech therapist told me it'd be the best way to learn because I'd be able to do it before talking. Um, I think it took months for me then to find a music teacher who was going to come in and teach me to sing because the school didn't have a singing teacher or any music teacher of any sort. This is very sad. On a more cheerful note, <laughs> to, pun not intended, um, the, what's going on now, though, with an, in some ways it, it may be coincidental that it's, that it's come alongside the growth of interest in Paralympic uh, uh, yes. uh, and, and TV exposure, particularly, and and television then bringing people with a whole range of disabilities on in front of the screen and being able to talk directly and so on. that does suggests that there is a shift going on. It does appear to be a huge shift and there appears to be a lot of organisations trying to fight for change at the moment within the, I guess, the musical world, within the um, disability world. That does, that's a really impressive shift, actually. I've been to a few talks and stuff where people are getting together and trying to make these changes. But I think that shift has started. Yeah, definitely. And I think, too, it's coincidental with technological developments and yeah. computing power which is going to help us in many different ways and the way the competition operates is our invitation to the technologists of the globe to uh, to get brainy and do something about yeah. it. Uh, we don't quite know what's going to come back although we have some very very interesting instruments um, being um, entered into the competition so far. So I'm actually quite optimistic that they will be there in the same way that I'm very optimistic you'll solve the clarinet problem yeah. and, uh, and that there are solutions out there. I have waited years for a company like OMI to come along and it's so exciting that there's one eventually coming because um, I love the traditional route and I'll be, it'll be an honour if I can one day play, go down that route again and just learn to play a traditional instrument along with others and be counted as a musician rather than someone with a special need or disability and be accepted as a musician and, and it's just amazing that OMI is doing this. I'm really very grateful to you, Charlotte, for your time today and for talking so frankly about these issues. They're extremely important, very important for us, but I'm sure even more important for you and your colleagues. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been much. great. Thank you. Yeah.